I don't know about you, but I like making New Year's resolutions. You know, that wasn't supposed to be a funny line, but I'm, I'm glad. Uh, there's something about the beginning of a new calendar year that seems like a great opportunity to look back at the year gone by and then to set some intentions for the year to come. But this year I noticed that I was writing down some of the same resolutions that I've been writing down for five straight years to no great avail. I felt like a broken record. I resolved to lose 15 pounds, to read more, to exercise regularly, and the list went on from there very predictable. I've been saying many of the same things every year, and I was doing it again. Now, I felt a sense of futility and failure. This would be a time for you to say, oh. <laughs> you know, what am I doing this for? Setting out intentions for the year if it doesn't seem to make much difference. In the Christian scriptures, Paul complains that my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Now, I can relate to Paul. It's a conundrum. To have the will to do something, but to lack the willpower to make it happen. You don't know what I'm talking about, do you? <laughs> I'm just talking to myself up here this morning, I can tell. Now, believe it or not, I found solace in the Bible. This is where you're supposed to say, really? <laughs> now, I realize that not everybody here reads the Bible. And I don't blame anyone for that, because not many people truly understand how to read the Bible. If you think about it, nobody picks up a dictionary and just starts reading from page one and then reads it all the way through like it's a novel. I'm pretty sure that if someone tried to do that, pretty soon they would say, I don't like reading the dictionary. No, of course not, because that's not how to read it. The dictionary is not meant to be read, starting on page one, and it's the same with the Bible. The Bible is not a book. It's a library of books, and different books have different purposes and communicate different information in different ways. Some books of the, Bibles inclu in the Bible includes history, some poetry, some prayers, some mythology, some proverbs, some prophecy, some laws. They're not all meant to be read in the same way. The problem most people have with the Bible is that they don't know how to read it. For example, I received a call yesterday morning while I was working on this sermon from an elderly man from a small town in Oklahoma. He saw my picture in the Tulsa World newspaper yesterday, and it said I was a minister. So he somehow found my number, and he called to discuss the Bible. Pretty soon, he moved on to the shootings at Fort Hood, and then he segued into the problems with computers and casinos. <laughs> as far as he was concerned, computers like casinos are the domain of the devil. He doesn't know how to use a computer, so he thinks computers are nothing but trouble. Apparently, he knows how to use 411 to look up somebody's phone number, though. You probably have heard someone who doesn't understand the internet trash-talking about how the internet is nothing but a waste of time. Well, the problem is that they don't know how to use the internet, and that's why they discount it. It's the same with the Bible. Often, people who badmouth the Bible or don't have an appreciation for it are people who don't have a clue how to read it. The mistake that some people make is they read it literally. You see... Back in ancient times, people understood that there were different ways of knowing. For example, the Greeks, they knew the difference between logos and mythos. You know, logos is practical knowledge. It involves logic and reason. Whereas mythos is mythological understanding. And it uses stories 
and symbols and metaphors and images. Now today, many people don't understand or respect mythos as a valid way of knowing. If you call something a myth today, then most people think that you're saying that it's untrue or fake. In Oklahoma, if you say that the Bible contains myths, those are like fighting words. But myth is not a negative term. For centuries, people understood the role of mythos to convey truths that cannot be conveyed through logic. We need to have the right kind of knowledge for the right kind of activity. If you're planning a trip, you want to use logos to make a list of what to bring, to read the maps, to set a schedule. Medical doctors and engineers need logos to do their jobs, and doctors using logos can usually tell us how someone died or why someone died. But logos cannot help heal our hearts after we lose someone we love. It's one of the reasons we have military chaplains and not just military doctors. Healing our hearts is in the realm of mythos. Logic cannot soothe our sorrow. Stories and images and poetry convey the kinds of wisdom that touches our hearts and binds up our brokenness and cultivates courage within us. These ways of knowing are not in competition with each other. They just deal with different realms of life and understanding. Now today I'm talking about grace, which means unearned blessings. Grace is an undeserved gift freely given, without a price. Grace is one of those concepts that cannot, we cannot fully grasp with logos. Take the story of the prodigal son. There's a man who has two sons. One of his sons asks for his inheritance early, and the father gives it to him. And the son goes out and wastes all his money in a short time, doing things that dishonor himself and his family. The man's other son stays home, working for his father day in and day out for his whole life. But when the prodigal son returns home, poor and penniless and humiliated, the father runs out to embrace him with love and forgiveness and a smile of great joy. Then he tells the other son to kill the best calf that they have so that they can celebrate his brother's return. Now the son who's remained home doing all the right things is incensed and insulted. His father never prepared a party for him and his friends. And he's been loyal and diligent all these years. Now how could the father hold a party for the brother who's defiled the family's name and who's wasted the father's hard-earned money? This story is not meant to be read as a a factual history, but it's in the realm of mythos. One of the beauties of myths is that there are many truths that can be discovered depending on how we read and interpret the story. They come alive, rich with meaning, depending on which perspective you take. One day I'm going to do a sermon on the prodigal son, and a sermon series. Every week I'm going to take the perspective of a different member of the family And each one of those stories will have a different truth and understanding and interpretation, each valid, but each coming from a different angle. That's the beauty of these stories and of myths. 